with governments trying to push people towards EVs, surely that can't work because there aren't enough EV chargers. Uh, once again, chicken and egg that you cannot just go out and build enough chargers for 30 million cars, which is what we have on the road today in petrol cars. So there has to be an evolution. As more electric cars go on the road, you build more chargers. As you get more chargers, more EVs will be added to the road. So there's an evolution. And if at any one moment in time, you may have an imbalance. You may have more EV chargers available than cars on the road and vice versa. One of the big differences though, is that with electric vehicles, many of them, and I'm talking probably more than half, will probably never use a public charger. They will only ever charge at home. And an even larger number will only ever use public chargers on a very few occasions. We did an interview with Tom recently. He's a typical family man, a husband, wife, one child. Uh, he has an electric car and he charges at home throughout the whole of the year and only ever charges at a public charger two or three times a year when he's going away on a road trip for a family holiday. And so the need for public charges is very different to the need for petrol pumps, so you can't have a direct comparison. It will stabilize over time, but there'll be a learning curve to go through as we find out what the ideal number actually is. At the moment, I personally believe that we have more than enough EV chargers available to the public than we actually need. With EVs accelerating and going through tires potentially faster, depending on how you drive them. Are EVs responsible for more air pollution from their tires? We're talking here about PM 2.5 and smaller particulates in the air. And it's exactly the same answer. If you wear a tire away by a fast acceleration or by fast cornering, it will produce more particulates than if you drive very slowly and sedately. So the amount of particulates you produce is dependent on your driving style and uh, therefore you're in control of that. And one of the things I find, this is a very, very fast car. This will outperform an awful lot of Ferraris and Lamborghinis. Um, but as I get older and start slowing down myself, I find I drive this a lot more sedately than I expected to. I still have my moments where I do racing stars from traffic lights, just a little bit of fun. Um, but generally speaking, I drive quite sedately. I don't usually drive the speed limit. I'm set at 60 at the moment, speed limit 70. Uh, I like a nice relaxed style and that produces less uh, PM 2.5 particulates. Um, so I like to think I'm doing my best. So we might have enough public EV chargers, but if everybody goes EV and plugs in at home, surely we're going to have grid blackouts. We're just going to run out of electricity. Again, this is going to be a learning curve because one of the big things that's heading our way in the future is something called vehicle to grid. Now, the grid is not a stable thing. We have peaks and troughs. We have high demand, we have low demand. Overnight, the backbone of the grid, power stations ticking over, uh, produce more electricity than we use. Everybody's asleep, factories a large, to a large extent are closed down. And so we produce a lot of energy. Wind turbines still turn, solar panels obviously don't. So that's why you get your cheap overnight rate. The grid is producing more than it needs. At peak times, when everybody comes home from work, turns on the oven, turns on the lights, turns on the TV, turns on the kettle, turn, everything goes on. There are huge demands on the grid, which they find very difficult to cope with. And at those times, the grid really struggles. If every car was plugged in simultaneously and every car had a feature called vehicle to grid, which is on its way now, it's starting already and soon that every car will have this, then the cars themselves, the batteries on board, will actually become part of the grid. And at those peak times, 
those cars will actually become part of the grid and they will supply the grid during those peak times. And then when the overnight period comes, when there's excess electricity, those cars will then top up again. So the grid will become cars and the cars will become the grid. That's the future. And there'll be no need for extra power stations. That is nowhere near here yet. In the meantime, we don't have blackouts. We haven't had blackouts for a long, 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 long time. The last blackouts were in the 70s, and that was caused by strikes. We don't have blackouts, and the grid is coping. Given that it's a pretty rainy day today, is it really safe to be charging an EV in the rain? After all, electricity and water, they don't mix. Yes, but a lot of regular viewers will know that I was in the Royal Navy for a while and I seem to remember that submarines had very high voltage electricity and they spent a lot of time underwater. Uh, now, a bit of a facetious answer, but of course, electricity and water regularly mix. Uh, you just have to be very careful. The procedure for charging the electric car is a very, very complex one, but very, very safe. When you take a plug out of an electric charger, and, and please, nobody do this, but if that was to be dipped into a puddle of water, there is no danger whatsoever of any electricity uh, being involved. There is a sensor in the plug, and that sensor, when you plug it into your car, will talk to the car. And the first thing it will do is it will ask, is it safe? And the car will say, yeah, I'm safe, so let's talk. They will then talk, and then the car will say, right, send me a bit of electricity. And the charger will send a bit of electricity, and the car will reply, yeah, I got that safely, everything's safe, are you safe at your end? And they have a conversation. And then the car will say, a bit more electricity, the car will say, yeah, I've got that, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. And it builds up until they reach a point where the car says, thank you, that's as much as I can handle. This is what's going on. If at any time anything is unsafe, instantly the power is cut. These are amazingly safe. I regularly plug my car in at home in the pouring rain, remove the plug in the pouring rain. It is absolutely 100% safe. There is no danger whatsoever. Well, traffic has certainly built up quite a bit. Absolute chaos on the roads. But it gives us a chance to film a few more questions here. So are EV batteries polluting landfill sites? Uh, the quick answer is yes, but not for the reasons people think. Uh, it's the reasons why, if you go to a landfill site, you will also find recyclable material in there. It's just, to some people, it's cheaper just to dump this stuff rather than to recycle it properly. Uh, re uh, rechargeable batteries should never be dumped. The materials on board are so valuable and so easy to recycle that they shouldn't end up on landfill. Unfortunately for some people, it's just a business that they will dump stuff and just make money out of it. Um, there's a firm called Redwood over in America, which says that something like 95% of every battery in an EV is fully recyclable and it's valuable stuff inside there. So they can be recycled and they, and they should be recycled, but I don't believe at the moment we have sufficient facilities in the right locations for people to be able to make use of it. And so the quick answer is some people will just dump them uh, as they do uh, with, uh, what do they call it? Uh, the council's um, fly tipping is what they call it, where people will just charge people for tipping and they'll dump it in a farmer's field. So unfortunately, some is ending up in landfill, uh, but it shouldn't. Continuing on from sort of the environmental impact, um, there's the accusation that mining for EVs is worse than ice vehicles. Um, yeah, it's different. You see, every vehicle has a certain content that, that is always mined. And we forget this, that a car has steel uh, bodywork and chassis, and that is a mined material. Uh, it's iron ore. 
uh, that iron has to be processed and go into a steel refinery and turned into steel. And that's a process. And most steel, re uh, steel refineries are uh, blast furnaces and the like, which are huge, huge uh, users and uh, of uh, energy and produce carbon dioxide. And in fact, I had noticed just the other day in the news, uh, Port Talbot, uh, refinery has just closed down with a loss of a lot of jobs, but they are actually installing the first of a um, series of blast furnaces, which are going to be electrically powered by Tata Steel. Uh, so uh, everything in the world that we use is produced by somebody, and EVs are no exception. Uh, we just use different, different materials. Uh, with batteries in the future, they're talking about using sodium ion batteries, and that can be made from seawater. A lot of the body shells for cars, uh, for EV cars, are made from aluminium, for example, uh, because it's lighter and that's better, better for efficiency. And aluminium is a much more common material, much more easily found in, um, in uh, nature. Um, so, no, I don't accept that uh, it is massively worse than anything else. It's just using different resources. And also the other thing to point out is that with so much being recyclable, which is that batteries can just be recycled. So whilst there's an, uh, an initial cost, eventually that environmental impact will diminish because it, the materials will just be recycled endlessly. I think that also applies to cars because now cars have to, by law, be recyclable. Um, if you take an engine out of a petrol car, that can be melted down and made into another engine. If you take an aluminium engine block, that could be melted down again. So uh, I think we're entering a, recycl a recyclable phase. Um, so yeah, um, all cars can be recycled, whether they're EV or petrol, diesel or whatever they are. Well, that brings us to the end of our rainy day adventures. I hope that you have all enjoyed uh, us addressing some of these EV myths, these concerns, these fears that people have around it. And hopefully it's put your mind at ease. And of course, as ever, if you vehemently disagree with everything that's been said, let us know where we've gone wrong. I'm Jonas. I'm Dave. Thank you for watching.